Well, my goodness, what a fantastic start to the talk. Thank you, Lydia. That was absolutely brilliant. She set a very high standard. Right, well, here we go. Um, no, I think that's the one. Find the right one. There we go. I thought I'd just outline what I'm going to talk about. I also want to say that I've brought a, a, up in the main room there upstairs, there is a display cabinet with some very old gear in it. So uh, there we are. Anyway, let's get on with this now. So maybe a bit of a confusing title there. I'm not talking about type 2 diabetes, I promise. Um, but it, this will make it apparent. I, that, that, was me, that was me. I was born an awful long time ago. You see, I'm a bit, of a, bit long in the tooth. Um, but, and I was lucky to be born out in, in, in East Africa, out in, in Kenya. It was a wonderful place to grow up. That was me when I was ill. I apparently never, never stopped smiling and laughing. I was a very happy child. Um, but, but, but to look at me there, I was, I, was, uh, I was really not in a good place. I don't remember diagnosis at all. Um, I was, I was, it was 1956. I was just two years old, two years and a month. That was my lovely mum. Fantastic. And for that reason, I just wanted to show my parents I owe them so much. My family, my whole family, my sons, um, been wonderful su support, but mum and dad, mum was a nurse. She was horrified when, uh, when I was diagnosed with type, type 1 because she had, only, she had only seen the bad sides of it in hospital. She'd seen people in for ketoacidosis, etc., and she'd seen the other end of the scale, people coming into hospital four or five times a week with hypos. She'd seen the very worst, worst of it, and she was terrified. But the doctor said, you don't need to worry. He's, he's got a good start, and how right he was. My dad was an engineer. He knew nothing about type 1, but my goodness, he studied it. I've got books that he's outlined things in red and written notes in it. I've still got them, and uh, I'll keep them until my dying day. My sisters there, my two sisters, my, they, they continue to be a support. But I thought it's worth pointing out my dear old mum and dad had a really tough time because my eldest sister, sitting in the middle there, she was given a drug when she was a, a kid out in Kenya that they now know causes deafness. And she is stone deaf in one ear, and only has about 8 or 10% hearing in the other ear. So if I've had a tough life, she's had a much, much tougher life. So dear old mum and dad, they, they had, a, they had a, quite a job. I was very fortunate to be put under the care of this great man. What an inspiration he was. I, I can't really remember him all that well, but he was wonderful to my parents. He almost died of type 1 diabetes back in 1920, um, and he went out to Florence to live his last days. He didn't want his family to see him literally withering away. Um, and th he then received that telegram, um, which... <laughs> lovely, isn't it? And literally, I think he came home and they started experimenting, literally, and tried, tried it out on him. So uh, there we go. So it was a particular honour to receive his, for my 60-year medal, um, the Lawrence Medal. I can tell you, it, it meant so much to me, and it's, you'll see it upstairs in the glass case there. That's a, one of the letters. I've printed that out upstairs as well for you to look at that came from my, fr to my parents. Quite amusing to see that uh, he says he'll need occasional blood sugar tests. <laughs> my goodness, we do them several times a day now, don't we, how things have changed. I'm also in touch with his daughter-in-law, who's written this fantastic book, and there is a copy up there. I've signed my name in it, so don't walk off with it, please. Um, it, it's, it, that's a wonderful read as well. Right, I think we should never forget, because I only missed this by 30 years. That, you've probably seen that gruelling picture. I never realised that that little boy there was 14 years old in that picture, and he was the first one ever to receive uh, an insulin dose. Um, and thanks to Leonard that we, and, and all the work that went beforehand. But I think it's worth remembering that. That's what we, I would have ended up like. Certainly, and, and uh, Dr. Lawrence nearly did. And it's only thanks to this wonder drug. I think it is absolutely fantastic. Um, I treat it like gold. I hate wasting any of it. So you're probably wonder, wondering, has much changed over 60-odd over years? That's my response. <laughs> that was probably, I think that was the first uh, thing that my mum used to carry the syringe around. It used to have not surgical spirit, methylated spirits in it, the purple stuff, to keep it sterilised. Um, and the needles were kept in those pe peculiar things there, great big needles. That's the, that was the syringe once it was out of the case. And you're probably wondering what those bits of wire are. Well, they were actually used to keep the needles clean. You had to p poke, the, poke any muck out because the needles were used many, many times until they got blunt. 
They were sharpened. I don't remember the sharpening, but my dad being a fantastic engineer, I reckon they'd have been the, the sharpest needles around. They really would. Um, they're, they're, there you can see a close-up. They were, they were quite, quite horrible. I, I've had painful injections with the little ones at times. Um, I can't really remember what it was like. The biggest change in my life, and I, I can say this without any shadow of a doubt, was going on to the pen. I just suddenly found fantastic freedom, um, not carrying all this gear around. It was such a magnificent change. People said to me, when you go on an insulin pump, it'll change your life. It has improved my life. It's not been such a significant change as the pen, I have to say, but it's, it's great to have it. It really is wonderful. Guestimating, and I think I used the right term there. That was the kit I used to have, or my parents used to have to carry around to test urine. Um, even the jam jar, and I used to pee into that. Um, you're probably thinking, what on earth is that funny thing down the bottom? Well, we used to originally have to test the t hold the test tube o and boil it over a flame. And in Kenya, we didn't have a c gas cooker. So my dear old dad, he engineered that, and it's up in the glass case there. It still works. Um, so this is the recipe. Five drops, five drops of urine, 10 drops of water, add a tablet. I think it was a powder beforehand. I can't really remember when you used to have to boil it up. Um, and then you ended up with one of six colours, actually. There, there are only four there. Blue, incidentally, was considered a danger zone because that could be anything from zero millimoles per litre equivalent and up to 10.5 or 10.6, I believe. I, that's what I'm told. So it had a big margin. So my parents were always aiming to keep me above 10.5, believe it or not. It sounds crazy now, doesn't it? But we're always aiming to be above 10.5. And the green went up to something like 15, I think. I mean, it seems ridiculous now. But the, it, probably even more amazing is the fact that the results were well out of date. When you did a urine test, it was sh reflecting your blood sugar four hours before. So it's amazing I'm standing here, really. <laughs> that, that was another great change. I can remember I had, a, I had a Triumph Dolomite Sprint. I don't know why I need to say that, but it's a wonderful car. I remember driving back down to... to for Christmas down to Winchester, I'd got this, I'd got the pens, and I felt I'd got, I was really in touch with things. Um, you had to get a big blob. I used to have to stab my finger with a, a sharp, sharp thing, didn't have a lancet device, put it on there, wait for a minute, it had to be pretty exact, wipe it, hold it up to the, uh, wait for another minute, hold it up to the colours, and uh, judge what you were. If you were very high blood sugar, you had, to, you, you, you had the penalty of having to wait another minute um, down below there, but it was a big change. And the NHS, we, they used to encourage us to cut those in half or even into three to make them go further. Things don't change much. But I'll tell you what, it was a lot cooler to be seen with those than it was carrying all that paraphernalia around on your first date, I can tell you. <laughs> Went on to meters. Uh, this is the meter I love particularly because I do a lot of trekking and hiking and things, and you carry it around and it, you haven't got strips that you end up dropping in the mud and all the rest of it. Um, but what a change, and I've tried that out. I'm on, I'm on, uh, uh, I'm on the uh, Dexcom at the moment, G4, and I, it's fantastic. What a, you imagine the change from urine testing to that, and the control we've got now is fantastic. I think the future is really exciting. I'm excited about the future. I think there are great things ca happening. I sincerely hope there'll be a cure, but I think there's a very bright future ahead te technologically wise. Some, very, some of my favourite kit. Well, that looks pretty gruesome, but it's actually only about that long. Um, and that I used for donkey's years. I wore one completely out. You can see it up there. Um, that's it on the left photograph, cocked, ready to give the injection. You hold it up to your flesh, press the button, and it was, it was so simple. It was wonderful. Um, that box there I had for many years. That's it with all the stuff inside. Um, it wouldn't have had Fiasp and uh, Nova Rapid in it. <laughs> it would have had isophane and soluble insulin in there. But what a wonderful kit. Mine was absolutely hammered. It had a crack in the top, the lid fell off, and I threw it away. But I bought this from the, the States only the other day. It arrived last week, and I was so, it's like an old friend returning. And it's so tiny. It's wonderful. I, lots of people haven't seen those either. That was a great thing. It was the first one that King's College Hospital ever gave me. Um, to keep a record of when I'd taken my insulin and how much I'd taken. And it was, it was wonderful. I think we all think, gosh, have I, have I had my insulin? Um, that one's reading 18 units 12 hours ago. 
And they, they even had one, I never had one of these, that had a blood test meter on the top, on the lid. Some really good forward thinking back in the 80s. So I think it's time to talk, move on to the next section now. Don't want you getting bored with uh, technology. Um, my life outside. Well, I've, I have two lovely sons, Jamie and his girlfriend, Emily, and Andy and Chloe there. And Andy and Chloe have just given me my first granddaughter, <laughs> little Lily. And it, would you believe it, I'm being an awful, awful granddad. It's her first birthday party today, and I'm missing it. <laughs> but I did sign up for this a year ago, and I couldn't, I couldn't, let, them, I couldn't let them down here. So happy birthday, Lily. Um, I've been a t teacher of design and technology. These are some of the things. I set up a new department in a gir girls' school in Chertsey, and they just loved the subject, absolutely loved it, and it really took off. So it's, it hasn't stopped me doing that kind of thing. Has it stopped me doing much? Absolutely not. It's never stopped me doing anything. That, believe it or not, was uh, in, in Kenya. I think it was pretty brave that my parents took, us, took me back to Kenya. The healthcare wasn't nearly so good over there, but my mum was really confident. And would you believe it, it, back in those days with all that gear, um, that when we left Kenya, we decided to drive all the way from Nairobi down to Cape Town, nearly 5,000 miles on dirt roads. And my dad had every spare part conceivable for the car. <laughs> and my mum had every spare part for my urine tests, for everything else, for me and for Janet and her hearing aid as well. So, you know, it was, it was a wonderful trip. That's us at Victoria Falls. Had a wonderful time. But the great thing was it, that they set me up with the right attitude. Don't let it stop you doing things. And I, 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 I owe them an enormous thanks. Even when we got back to, to this country, we ended up doing Snowden. And someone took us or advised us to go up this way, which is the most, <laughs> it's the most difficult hiking route up Snowden. And I don't know whether I took my, my urine test gear with me or not. My parents, we, we never adjusted insulin except for illness. That was the only thing we adjusted insulin for. And so what my parents, they got it down to a fine art. Every, every half hour, they'd give me a boiled sweet, every 40 minutes, something like that. I thought I was in heaven. I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, but, I mean, the ridge goes right the way down to the far side of the photograph over there, and then back along up towards the summit. It was quite scary. I, I loved it, though. I didn't do a lot until my 50th birthday, and I decided to walk from Winchester to Eastbourne, which is... Um, it's about 100, 105 miles. I did it in six days. I did it entirely alone, not because I'm a sad old thing, but because I wanted to prove to myself that I could look after my type 1 diabetes um, and mo monitor everything and keep control. I wasn't, I wasn't using urine tests at the time, by the way. But uh, I raised, that was my first fundraising thing, I raised just over £9,000 for Stephanie Marks' appeal. I won't talk about Stephanie Marks now. If you want to find out about it, do have a look online. Then came the big one. The wonderful charity, JDRF, well, DUK are wonderful too, but they, they both are. But JDRF, they contacted me and said, would I like to be one of the, one of the people going up um, Kilimanjaro? It ended up 19 of us, with, all with type 1 diabetes, going up Kilimanjaro. You couldn't hold me back. I was even prepared to tell my head teacher, I'm going, I'm sorry, discipline me if you like. Um, I wasn't going to stop going. That's us on summit, summit night. I haven't talked much about it, but that's summit night. We were leaving at 11 o'clock at night, about minus 12, and I think it got colder. And it's such a thrill that we've got certainly Monica Touche here, who's, who uh, came up with me. And I, Paul Coker said he was coming as well. I don't know whether he's here. But uh, absolutely wonderful. That's me, just to prove I made it to the top. My blood sugar hit 27. We're never normally up there. So I went off and I had a pee and uh, had a correction dose. And I turned around and saw that wonderful view. Isn't it st stunning, the sunrise, sunrise from, from the summit? That's the wonderful team. And they have really brought me out because I, I, didn't, I didn't know anyone with type 1 diabetes before I climbed Kilimanjaro. So I missed out, I missed out for 58 years of, of having type 1 diabetes. I decided to celebrate my 60th year. So I thought, let's do something, something different. I've always wanted to go to South America. Uh, so that's where, we didn't go up to the top of that, don't worry, that, but we got, we got quite close. Um, that's our group. Sadly, only one other person with type 1. I wanted lots of type 1s to come with me, but Louise, who's two on the left there, she, she was a wonderful, wonderful companion to have with me, and we looked after each other very well. Um, I did support lots of charities. I didn't raise money, unfortunately, for input. Wonderful charity, absolutely superb. Thank you, Leslie, for all your work you do with them. Uh, but I did support JDRF and Diabetes UK. And that is the sum summit of Vinikunka, or the Rainbow Mountains. 
And wow, what a, what a fantastic place to go. So, do I have any other challenges planned? I'm afraid so. Um, <laughs> please, please don't laugh, though. I'm, I'm signed up for my first ever half marathon. <laughs> Paul, Paul Coker, who came up per Kilimanjaro with me, he's very instrumentally set up the One Bloody Drop dot com website about sport and type 1 diabetes. If you haven't seen it, do have a look. And he's managed to, get, he managed to persuade them to let 101 people with type 1 diabetes run in the marathon. And p several people said, you'll never do it. You'll never do it at all. He's now, I think, got 122 signed up. And I'm one of them, so I'm looking forward to it. I'll run it, walk, walk it, I don't care, as long as I make it. Uh, now, my thoughts on diabetes. I better move on because I don't want to take up too long. Um, I went to a wonderful talk by Dr. Kenneth Robertson, um, and I copied his slide. I did ask him, and he sends his best wishes, Parthra. So uh, he's, he was very happy for me to use this. But he made that statement. No other condition requires s so much continuous effort and deep understanding from the sufferer. I don't like the word sufferer. I wouldn't have used that. I don't feel I've suffered. I know some have, but uh, I don't like that. But interesting statement. Insulin is one of the deadliest drugs. I think we know that. I'm not trying to scare anyone, but um, and we all ha have great respect for it. Um, but I think it's, it's worth remembering that. I had to look up the word titrate to be absolutely sure, to self-titrate. And that means adjusting things to what, what, what you know, your stress levels. I've been feeling quite st stressed, obviously. My blood sugar went up to 16 a minute ago. It's never normally up there. Um, but, you know, healthcare professionals, lots of conditions, you, you take two tablets in the morning, three in the evening, whatever it is. But we're constantly adjusting things, stress for women, time, time of the month, etc. And I think we do a damn good job, don't you, by and large? Most healthcare professionals, this is what he said, don't understand how to do this. And I'm sure he's not talking about the likes of Partha or the people that care for me at King's College Hospital. But I think they've never actually lived with it. So they don't know exactly what it's like. They know the theory back to front and inside out, but they don't know exactly what it's like. They do a wonderful job, though. Personal reflections. I've so often had that said to me, <laughs> so often. And my, my polite response is that. <laughs> my less polite response is that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I, 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 I saw this online. It's, it's an old 1968 balance magazine, and I, I love the picture. But my point in showing you that is that that is the only link that we used to have with people with, with the, the diabetes world before. There was no internet, no social media. Um, if you happened to know someone living down the road with type 1, you were very lucky. I didn't know anyone until I was 50, 58 years into it. And so... I, it was Kilimanjaro that changed that and those wonderful people that I climbed with. And I hope we're going to do something, something again one of these days before I'm too old. Type 1 has lots of negatives, doesn't it? But it, as Lydia was saying, it, it does have its pos positive side as well. It's given me all of those things, I think. And I really feel I'm a positive sort of person, but I, I think I appreciate life an awful lot more than I probably would have done if I didn't have type 1. I really do. And it's never stopped me doing anything at all. I've never had any wish for sympathy. It makes me feel really uncomfortable if someone comes up to me and says, oh, I feel so sorry for you. It must be awful having those things. Oh, those injections and the pumps and all the rest of it. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, I just merely have a hope that, they'll, that you know, there's greater understanding. And I think diabetes is one of, all forms of diabetes is one of the most in, misunderstood conditions. And I think we've got a large, uh, that's largely part of the, the press that we have. I think they do a, a pretty lousy job of, of, of um, reporting on diabetes, type one, type two, whatever. And I think they've, they've got a lot of ground to make up there. But on the other hand, if someone walked in here now, seeing us talking about type one diabetes, looking around, they would look around and say, well, they look pretty healthy. No one's doing anything peculiar now, is there? What are they, what's all the fuss about? <laughs> Maybe we need to understand it. Because probably in this room, there'll be people like myself with very high blood sugars. There'll be people in here who might be very low. There may be some people who are perhaps even not focusing on what I'm saying. They're not missing very much, but um, <laughs> they might not be focused. 
The only t time people see us at, our, our, at, the, at the worst is when we're in hospital with DKA or we're writhing on the floor, like I've done hundreds and hundreds of times, um, with, with very low blood sugars. And the most hurtful thing that they can ever say, and it's been said to me before, is he's not very well controlled. And that really hurts. Um, I just wanted to talk about what got me into talking. And it was the first JDRF, Mon Monica and I actually went to this in uh, Tunbridge. And we were really embarrassed because at the interval, they made us both stand up and said, hey, these guys have just been up Kilimanjaro. And we got a big cheer and a round of applause. But in the interval, this gentleman came up and he was almost in tears when he spoke to me. And he said, I can't tell you how good it is to, to meet you. He said, my little daughter is only just over a year old, I think. She's had it since about five months. And he said, our lives have been complete hell. And he said, we, we just don't know what to do with ourselves. And seeing someone like you and Monica, it just, it just makes us feel so hopeful. And he said, he pleaded with me. He said, please, please, please go out and tell your story. And, and, and that's what I've done. And I, I never kept contact with the, ch the, the gentleman, unfortunately. If he's here now, I'd love to meet him again, say thank you. Um, just some personal advice. I'll let you read those. And I just want to talk about the last four, and then I'm finished. By the way, exercise, I don't mean that sort of thing. Cycling, walking, going to the gym, whatever. But I, I highly recommend it. Some people I find, it sounds very dictatorial to say, do not make it. I should have said, try not to make type 1 your enemy. I sometimes hear people say, oh, I hate my diabetes so much. And every time you see them, they're saying the same thing. Um, if you can try and learn to live with it, in a way, make it your friend. Um, you know, it's, it helps so much. Don't make it an enemy ever. Now, this is an interesting one. I sometimes get really cross when I hear people saying, oh, it's so much easier today. Um, back, it, back in the day when I got it 50 years ago, um, we had long needles, we had urine tests, all the rest of it. Yes, it was tough. It was, it was, it was tough in lots of ways. But we have now almost uh, information overload. We have so much information. My blood sugar was probably doing this kind of thing. Now people are more like that, perhaps. And some people are trying to get absolutely straight, which I think is unrealistic myself. But, uh, um, you know, I, th I think we... That's what I mean by straitjacketing. I heard of a, a parent saying, my goodness, my, my son is, or son or daughter, I can't remember, is 7.5, they're going to get complications. Must be below that. I'm thinking, no, 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 you're going to do psycholo psychological damage, let alone, you know, not, not good diabetes control. So that's what I mean by straight, straitjacketing. Don't ever feel, a, feel, feel embarrassed to question what your HCP says. They speak an awful lot of common sense, but have a discussion about it. Remember. You're an expert too, okay? And try to develop a can-do. I mean, that's, I'm lucky I've got it. I've, I've always had it. Can-do, it's not going to stop me doing anything and, and be positive about the condition. I'm just going to finish with the slide of this very beautiful woman. Her name was Helen Keller. She didn't have type 1 diabetes, but she got meningitis when she was two years old. And uh, um, she lost two of her senses. She lost all her eyesight and her hearing and she was a very difficult student her governess worked really hard got her to read talk and she ended up writing books and I love one of the statements I try to live by it life is either an adventure or nothing and I think she's got the right approach if she can say it I think all of us can say it too so that is me um, last slide that's me and me and Tommy Teddy almost at the summit of uh, the Vinikunka um, if anyone wants to keep in touch or whatever, um, that's my Twitter address. And I've been very cheeky. I perhaps shouldn't have done this, but my, my, if, you, if, you, if I've touched you in any way, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not setting one up for the, uh, for, for the mar marathon. You can't keep asking people, but that one is still open for Peru. And if we're all trying to get, get more research done, and all the money is going to type one research. So there we are. That's me over and done with. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure. It's so, so casual as well. I'm just killing my jar <laughs> I expect a fanfare every time I remember my prescription. <laughs> so that is fascinating, isn't it? It's like a journey through history with um, type 1 diabetes. Just absolutely incredible. Um, and we do, we do kind of forget how so-called lucky we are, I guess, with the, the technology that's available to us. Not lucky.
<laughs> Not lucky at all, but, you know, that was a really, really fascinating chat. How, how diverse are the two speakers we've had already? Incredible. And you managed to fit it in 20 minutes. Did I really? Yes, you did. Um, I can definitely resonate with, with the information overload. I think that's almost the opposite problem we've got now. We've gone from being completely alone or feeling sometimes completely alone to this amazing, amazing amount of information. It is daunting. And that's what we're sort of saying about today is take the bits that inspire you and take the bits that resonate with you, but you don't necessarily have to agree with everyone's way of doing things or their approach to type one. And that really came across there that you're just, you're just doing what works for you and, and really, I think, inspiring others as well. Thank you so very, thank you thank very you much. much.